Hello everyone. It's a pleasure to see a lot of our old friends with us today. Although a lot of them have not arrived yet, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the people who are present uh, to our director and as I say, sort of informally start our reunion activities. Anil Agarwal. Thank you. Pankaj Desai. Gabriel Fernandez. What is all this? What is this? Is the indoor, indoor gymnasium. It has a squash court, it has indoor badminton courts, table tennis. Is swimming pool guy? Lot of things are not clear. Two o seven. We are in that ah. corner. Oh, corner. We were, I was in three o seven. We were roommates together. You were, yeah. you were somewhere here. I was in three zero seven. Yeah, right. I was in room. Yeah. Uh, ah. We know the room. I don't know the number right now. Okay. So what are your plans after you finish? You want to go to graduate school or find a job or? Well, uh, still not decided. So. Not decided yet. Yeah. Too early, huh? And where are you from? Which part of India? Uh, that's where I'm from. Rajasthan. And how about you? I'm from Andhra Pradesh. Andhra Pradesh. See, we are both from Bombay. Firoz and I were roommates. <laughs> this was my side, this was Firoz's side. Right, yeah. Of course, we never had any computers in those days. You know, we had slide rules, not even calculators. Yeah, we didn't have calculators, slide <laughs> rules. I still remember doing the iterations, you know. Do you guys know what a slide rule is? No, you, you don't know what, know what it is. It is. <laughs> yeah, it is an old version of a calculator. Anyway, <laughs> you know, see it yeah. in the museum one day. <laughs> In the beginning, when I had to come to Kanpur, the first semester was very difficult. And I, I thought that maybe I, if, I, if possible, I would have liked to transfer back to Bombay. But after one year, all thoughts of that vanished. And I was very comfortable in Kanpur. And I feel very fortunate that I made the choice to come to Kanpur. My mother was so much influence on me in the sense that she was like watching me all the time. I wanted to get out, you know, so I just decided I'm just going to go out away from everybody, away from the family. And I came to Kanpur, but it's the greatest thing that happened. The first day I entered IIT, I saw all the people, you know, fanning themselves in the heat uh, with their certificates. And everybody was 90%, 95%. And the pressure built up from day one. I, I was amongst the top students in my school. But here I seem to be very mediocre amongst the top uh, cream of the country. Do you people see this pressure from the beginning here? People are more concerned about their jobs. They try to build up their performance or the uh, like curriculum in terms of looking ahead four years down the line. I think in our time the journey was all important. And the destination was a matter of fact. It happened. I don't think we ever worried about when we started IIT in the first year, what kind of job will I get five years down the road? That was never even in our mindset. Actually, when we talked to a lot of former faculty members, we came to know that our former uh, founder director, Dr. P.K. Kelkar, he wanted to build an institution of this kind. So we thought it would be an interesting idea to know more about the history of our own institute. Knowing history in terms of, you know, having documents that which uh, director took over at what date, this is not important. What is important is that if we need to continue this uh, legacy, this uh, rich legacy of IITs, we need to know that what is in, uh, means what is so special. The institute becomes a part of your life when you leave it and it, you initiate your career here. It's definitely important to know the history, how this institute was built. All this is definitely important you, because you have to carry on the legacy. You have to. Nehru and his vision of a modern India driven by science and technology led to the setting up of premier institutes of technology across the country. The idea was to train engineers who would develop and run the newly independent country's industrial and scientific establishment. The first institute was established in 1951 at Kharagpur in West Bengal, 
followed a year later by another in Mumbai, and soon after, one in Chennai. A fourth institute was proposed in Kanpur in Uttar Pradesh. Kanpur was not the most suitable place for a technology institute of this kind. It was located away from any major metropolitan centre and lacked the kind of social or material infrastructure required to support an IIT. Equally hard was finding a suitable person to establish and run the place. The director's post was offered to Dr. P. K. Kelkar and everyone was relieved when he agreed. But those who were close to him knew it was a decision made in difficult circumstances. My father started that uh, Bombay IIT as a planning officer and then he was the deputy director of the institute. But appointment of the director, which was a political appointment, took place. He was disappointed that the Bombay IIT job was given to somebody for some reasons other than qualifications and especially somebody who was not in the academic world at all. He had the option, I think, of going either to Chennai, Madras, or to Kanpur, and he chose Kanpur. When I came to Kanpur to join as a director of the institute, almost everybody I met asked me if I wanted to commit professional suicide. I did not at all worry about this, because I was no longer myself but an instrument of a historical process. In 1959, IIT Kanpur commenced classes in rented space at the Harcourt Butler Technological Institute in Kanpur City with a hundred students and a small faculty drawn primarily from local colleges. Director Saab Jaha Bhatte Te, Maa Sari Officers Thi, Usi Ke Andar. Ek Store Bana Hoa Tha, Aur Aap Ke Kuch Lab Chemistry Ki, Physics Ki, Mechanical Bhi Kuch Log Aa Gaye Te. Waha Puka Mahaol Bada Acha Rehta Tha, Yaha Waha Par Yeh Nhi Pata Lagta Tha, Koun Director Hai, Koun Professor Hai, Koun Karamchari Hai. Sab Log Itna Ek Dousre Ko Chahate Thi, Itna Coordination Acha Tha, Ki Woh Log Bada Pyaar Dete Thi, Hum Log Bhala Ke Hum Log Waha Ke Lowest Karamchari Thi. We had a hostel, it was a textile institute, borrowed hostel, which could house about like 70 some people. There were some day scholars on Kanpur, they were coming as day scholars. We didn't even have a bus. Everybody huddled into a truck, uh, like a little blue truck, and we all like 50, 60 would pack, and we would be driven to HBTI campus. Ah. 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 Dr. Kilkar now turned his attention to finding young faculty who would be open to his ideas about teaching engineering. The early faculty tell many stories about their first encounter with Dr. Kilkar. I reached the HBTI campus. There was no department, there was nothing like the head of the department whom you go and report. So I just went and uh, knocked at the office of the director, you know, and uh, immediately I was ushered in. And when I walked into it, the first thing which I observed, most strikingly, that the director got up from his seat. You see. And when he walked, we shook hands. <clears throat> and he said, we have just given birth to our civil engineering department. Very easy for me to realize that here is a person who is going to employ me. He is the director of a, an institution that might become internationally famous. But that... I have no reason to be afraid of him. And it also gave me the impression that he wanted to learn from the young people like me rather than hand over knowledge, perception and information down. When we used to tell him that, look, we are very green kids. We have no experience, no teaching experience. And we are now asked to build up an institution. We sometimes feel very diffident. And then he said, look, I can bring professors with experience a time a dozen. What they do is they bring the system with them. I don't want that. What will you and people do? It will break, it will burn, and uh, uh, out of this comes ashes. From the ashes a phoenix will come out. 
and that will be it. In 1960, the government of Uttar Pradesh made available 1,200 acres of land for a new campus. The land was located 16 kilometers west of Kanpur near Kalyanpur, off the historical Grand Trunk Road. Most of the land had been acquired from Nankari village, a small farming community, no different from thousands of others across India's heartland. The government decision to set up the institute here brought to Nankari's doorstep a world they could barely imagine. But it also brought them face to face with an uncertain future. People were all aware that they didn't know what happened. Because they were all aware that 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 they were all aware फिर धीरे धीरे चूंकि हम लोग यहाँ के लोकल रहने वाले थे तो यहाँ के जो गांव के लोग थे जिनसे जमीन ली जा रही थी उन लोगों से हमने व्यक्तिगत संपर्क करके धीरे धीरे उन लोगों को तैयार किया इसके लिए कि तुम्हारा पैसा भी कुछ बढ़ाया जाएगा जो कम मिला है ये भी बातचीत हुई थी बीच में तुम्हारे घर के जितनी जमीन जिस चीज़ की जा रही है उसके परिवार के एक सदस्य को नौकरी सरकारी नौकरी मिलेगी कुछ लोगों को ये तो अंदाज था कि इतनी बड़ी जमीन ली गई है तो कोई बहुत बड़ी चीज़ कोई बहुत महत्वपूर्ण चीज़ यहाँ बनाई जा रही उसके बाद जब यहाँ पे अमेरिकन्स आए तो उनको लगा कि नहीं कोई बहुत ही ज़्यादा महत्वपूर्ण वो है क्योंकि यहाँ अमेरिकन भी काम कर रहे हैं तो उनको लगा कि कोई अजूबा बन रहा है campus was coming up in very early stages. There was uh, uh, one hostel uh, where we were all staying. We didn't even have the lecture blocks then. And the classes were being held in a, some kind of a temporary arrangement. That's how it all began. You know, we were all very excited. Most of the faculty were very young people. Uh, who'd come, many of them had come from overseas. Uh, we had uh, lots of Kiap American professors uh, and more arrived as uh, within the first, second year. In the late 1950s, the governments of India and the United States of America agreed in principle on a program in which the U.S. would aid the development of the Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur. This was to be called the Kanpur Indo-American Program, or KAYAP. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology was asked to send a three-man faculty committee to India to study the status of undergraduate engineering education. The committee, headed by Professor Norman Dahl, 
traveled across the country in January 1961. And what they saw convinced them about the need for a modern, scientifically oriented engineering institute. But it was only towards the end of the long journey that the team reached Kanpur for a meeting with Dr. Kelkar. And then Norman, my husband being the way he is, sat down and said, before we start talking about what we've learned, first we've had a wonderful time and I learned a lot, but you've known about this for a while. What have you been dreaming about? What do you think, what have you been thinking about this institution that you have responsibility for? So he talked about freedom of choice, freedom of, of movement. He had ideas about the physicality and the importance of, the, of, of architecture in, in, in a new institution and what it tells students, all the things that that they, they had been going through at MIT. That's what was so wonderful about all this business. The point is that this resonated very well. So on their way back to New Delhi, the next night in the overnight train, they said, he prays to the same gods we do. Because <laughs> it was just the, the perfect thing to say. <laughs> and so Norman did it and put it together. Wasn't that fun? Dear Professor Dahl, it looks as though something bigger than ourselves has taken possession of us. It is the future that is to be which is dominating the present and not the inevitability of the past. I feel excited and also afraid. Never before in my life have I agreed more with the poet who said that for us there is only the trying, the rest is not our business. Professor Kielker was an intellectual giant in, in the field of education. And uh, Norman Dahl was a very interesting, he was a mechanical engineer, designed nuts and bolts and so on. The English trained uh, Professor Kelker, you know, more senior, set in his ways, and Norman Dahl, an American brash, you know, wanting to do things. It, things could have gone terribly bad, as you understand. But boy, they, they really hit it. They became like twins. And uh, then the, the latent, uh, uh, the ideas that uh, Professor Kelker had flowered. He was not an technical engineer. He was, he always was interested in the philosophy of science, which included engineering. And I think he found a soulmate in Professor Dahl. Well, no, he was excited by the possibility because Dr. Kelkar's attitude towards students was so absolutely free and open. And it meant that if you respect students, you have to have faculty it's going to be able to let them go and explore and walk around and see and, and do things. The academic vision for IIT Kanpur was born out of Dr. Kilker's ideas and also influenced by the report of the American Society of Engineering Education, which recommended science-based engineering curriculum. They had uh, very consciously decided that the engineering education is not to be geared for today's needs, but for, uh, for the future India that was coming. I mean, his vision was that it must be a science-based engineering education, which should develop a very different, qualitatively different quality of mind of the students. He insisted that physics and mathematics and chemistry and humanities must be taught the way they should be taught. They should not be influenced by the engineers. And engineers should teach you the way they want to teach. But of course there has to be a bridge between the two. And the engineering science curriculum is the one which bridges science to engineering. Normally engineering courses were very much information oriented. This is how things are done, this is the practice. But obviously there must be a basis why this became a practice. If it is a question of dogma that yes, this is how it has to be done, then there it ends. Whereas if you think this is why it is done that way, then you can think, can I tinker and improve it? An undergraduate, first three years would take engineering subjects, the computer science, fluid mechanics, you take very important basic physics, mathematics, and chemistry, and other things, then you would all do other things. So, 
at the end of three years, these kids would be so good in these things. Most professors couldn't teach them afterwards. In fact, that was the problem. Most, even though they were very well-trained professors, they didn't have the kind of background our kids had, young boys after three years of this highly interdisciplinary teaching. So it was a grand scale experiment. There were no real textbooks for it. There were no teachers which had taught those courses. It was the re a revolution on the highest scale. I don't think anywhere in the world, in, in my opinion, had such a dramatic change in curriculum uh, been affected. At the institute at that time, uh, there was a very egalitarian atmosphere. And because of the leeway that he gave, everybody started becoming actively involved in the affairs. As a result, they, everybody thought that they owned the institute. And uh, uh, he encouraged that. I would decide, I want to do this. I never asked the director. I would go all over the place and take uh, all kinds of the, oh, we'll do that, we'll do this, we'll build this, we'll have a new national symposium, we'll have an international meeting, and then tell the director, and he would say, okay, okay, we'll do it. And so this kind of a freedom, not only of expression, which is easy to give, freedom of thinking, freedom of planning, freedom of thinking big. And there's a feeling that we are building a new and vibrant institution. So we really worked hard, much more than a job kind of attitude, and uh, that was the driving force for many of us. We were given a great deal of uh, freedom to design and to develop our own courses, so that it was both very satisfying and it was also a challenge. So there's a much greater degree of involvement when you're teaching something that you're totally responsible for. The whole bunch of people participated in creating an ultra-modern curriculum from scratch uh, in a sense of uh, camaraderie and togetherness, eg egalitarian and so on. And so it made us think about issues that we would never have thought about. And so we became a, a thinking uh, educational institution. That's not a small thing. Ah. Ah. The library was at the core of the academic life of the institute. Students had unlimited and open access to its stock of books and journals. This was only one of the unique features that define IIT Kanpur to this day and have also been adopted by many educational institutes since. The emphasis on studying humanities, the semester system, continuous evaluation of students, course-wise promotion, open book examinations, tutorials, and regular classroom quizzes. To most students, all this was very new. Oh, we had never heard of uh, quizzes, we'd never heard of seminars, uh, we'd never thought about the possibility that labs could be open in the night and people would work there. And the uh, sight of people coming enthusiastically into labs to work in on a in the night, then really attracted uh, young students to the idea of research because there seemed to be so much freedom. One of the things which was most unusual in the Kanpur curriculum was that 20 percent of our credits had to be in humanities and social sciences. Nobody had ever heard anything like that, that you're in school of engineering and you have to study psychology or you have to study economics. I did a course in, social sci in sociology, a course in philosophy, a course in development and under, under development. So that made you look at various aspects of problem. So you were no more unidimensional, but you could see things more holistically. Suddenly your teachers were people you could talk to, and uh, they also seemed to be t tremendously excited by what they were doing. I remember it was so much of a clarity was there in the mind of the professors that we really enjoyed. I mean, there was no question which could not be answered. We knew that we are talking to a set of people who are giant in their field. Among the more visible elements on the campus were the American professors from the nine consortium universities who took time off from their regular teaching responsibilities to spend as many as two years with the Kanpur Indo-American program. 
Many of them came with the understanding that they were part of an important process. It wasn't like going over there to give a series of 10 lectures and leaving or something, you know. It was working with them and developing the whole program and knowing that it's going to go on after you leave and helping get a good start in that direction. To see professors from Princeton, professors from MIT, Norman Thal was from MIT, you know, professors from Berkeley, uh, there was uh, professors from University of Minnesota, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all of them being there. And when they were teaching classes and when they would tell us that the quality of students at IIT Kanpur was no less than any of those institutions, and it was all, it was a, it was a, a wonderful feeling. In many courses, we were using exactly the same material that was being used at MIT, right? And when I say exactly the same material, not the material that was developed here 10 years ago, material that was developed here last term. The thrust on experiments meant that it was necessary to equip laboratories and workshops with suitable equipment. But in the 1960s, India's foreign exchange situation was precarious, and government permissions and licensing procedures to import machinery were long and tedious. The presence of Kayap helped greatly. Monetary provisions for equipment and government support for the program ensured that the latest equipment was easily available. The equipment traveled a long distance to the campus, and the last leg of the journey often had local color. An amusing story often told is how the first computer, the IBM 1620, also arrived at Kanpur on a buffalo cart. That is probably not true, but it is a fact that IIT Kanpur was one of the first institutions in India to get a computer soon after its advent in the U.S. There were very few computers in India at that time. None of us had ever seen one, let alone operate or written a computer language or written a program that worked. Oh, it was fascinating. I mean, just the... Of course, we knew nothing about computers. I mean, my notion uh, before I took the computer class at IIT was that somehow you just give it a problem and it solves it. And I remember, you know, we had punch cards and I went and typed an equation and fed it and nothing happened. And I said, it doesn't know anything, right? <laughs> because it's actually much easier if you have the real thing there, then you can do it and you show it and all the mystery, it, you, you, you know, disappears. I think it had a lot of excitement and, for instance, we also kept it very open to the students, so it was actually open 24 hours a day, it was heavily in use. <laughs> We were encouraged to bring our own technical work, and I brought a television studio. We did a bit of illegal broadcasting, um, and the uh, government of India shut us down. I also arranged to have the whole campus strung with closed circuit capability, and uh, one of the events that we put on the TV was the first convocation when Radha Krishnan was there. The airstrip and fleet of gliders for the aeronautical engineering department was another example of the bold initiatives which marked the unique personality of IIT Kanpo. Kanpur was originally conceived like an open, free-flowing space with no walls or boundaries. Dr. Kelkar was very clear that the architecture should reflect the philosophy of the institution. 
he found capable and willing collaborators in architects Kanvinde and Rai, who came up with a design that added an architectural dimension to IIT Kanpur's philosophy. This concept of creating an academic ambience through the buildings and through an architectural features was a concept in itself. According to me, it did bring out a very, you know, kind of profound uh, impact on the entire teaching learning process. Interdisciplinarity has been a hallmark of IIT Kharpur. So he has provided a corridor connecting every building to give a feeling that all buildings are the same. So rather than being individual buildings, it was something that tied the whole thing together. Along with, there was a certain interplay of spaces which gave uh, people places to pause, places for interaction, which was so important in this whole philosophy. You know, here you get buildings which are a little more rooted to their context. They utilize local materials which are available in plenty. You know, like the brick was very good in Kanpur at that time. And then mixing it with exposed concrete also spelled a departure. But more important, I think it was really the, the layout of the spaces. So that I think, I think became a underlying principle of IIT Kanpur in the sense, probably their curriculum also dictated this kind of a approach. IIT had absolutely no rules. You could do anything in the dorm, you could come and go. Nobody was telling us what we could do, and at the same time, the academic pressure was such. Uh, which was extremely enjoyable, that you also had to work. You know, so there are no rules, but you have to perform. <laughs> we did go to classes, and then uh, we did. <laughs> but we would do a lot of other things. <laughs> I remember playing a lot of bridge as well, <laughs> because when you put together a bunch of uh, uh, young people, all kinds of things happen. And, and uh, so we did lots of different things. discussions with our professors is the tremendous interaction with the peers, with our own uh, friends and uh, you know our seniors was really amazing. So the, all the discussions used to take place in the canteens. So over millions and millions of cups we used to discuss everything in the world. It was the time of the Vietnam War, it was the time of tremendous social ferment in India. The Naxalite movement had, 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 had started. Uh, 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 there were still the vestiges, if I may say so, of a nationalism that, uh, that was evident even in institutions like IIT Kanpur. There was a sense of nation building. There was a sense that corruption should be rooted out and that our politicians have failed us. There was all of this. 
and uh, 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 that had a deep impact on me. We had a study circle. We were trying to, something called as a Vivekananda Samiti. You know, trying to, uh, not, a, not a very radical organization, but uh, asking questions about society, science, right? Uh, so there were, there were small forums like this. There were so few of us, there were uh, 45 of us all together in an institute with 2,500 uh, uh, students. Um, you also got a lot of attention because you were the only girl, so you had the chalk thrown at you and God forbid that you didn't show up, you were, they noticed that you were missing, you didn't do your homework, um, you were say, said, you know, Anjali ji, aapka homework kidhar hai, you know, it, you were very much in the spotlight, you had to have a lab partner. And of course, you know, none of the boys really wanted to make it all of a walk to the girls' hostel to write lab reports with the girls. And of course, you were not considered really cool girls because you were at IIT and so on. And uh, the boys wouldn't sit next to you. And you're like, okay, fine. You know, so you just take things in stride. And uh, and and then, you know, as, as you got to get to know the boys and they get to know you, you form friends. And then all of these things became less important. We had uh, this thing called the Student Gymkhana, which is an umbrella organization under which various things happen. And there was, you know, there was a photography club if you were interested in photography, but there was also an electronics club, uh, which was again run entirely by students. I loved photography. I could, you know, I had my own dark room. I could do all the work that I wanted to do in there. I took a lot of pictures. We used to go out in a group just to take pictures. Pictures of the hostel, pictures of the mess, pictures of the cooks in the kitchen, everything. I don't know what it I was doing, but now if you look back, it's literally putting a chronicle of the whole four or five years over there. At that time, it was uh, just uh, the flowering of the intellect and uh, no uh, limit to that. So um, uh, you created all sort of very uh, interesting uh, things, but its impact you would not know at that time. And in fact, uh, I think the reason why some of the most of the ITNs have become very successful all over the world is because of that. And he wore demonstrators. The end of the 1960s was a period of great turmoil. There was unrest all over the world, and young people everywhere were restless and fighting authority. India was trying to cope with drought, economic recession, political turbulence, and dissent. IIT Kanpur could not remain unaffected. On the campus, problems revolved around the aspirations of the non-teaching staff and the hundreds of temporary workers whose fate was hanging in the balance. You know, Dr. Kail Karni yehi kaha tha, a conference hui thi Berkeley mein, usme ek paper unhon present kiya tha usme. To usme unhon yehi kaha tha, ki kisi bhi shiksha sanstha ke teen mahatpoorn hisse hote hain, faculty, student aur physical facilities. Ab aap samajhi ek residential campus hai, jisme jitni faculty hai, usse लगभग दस गुने ज़्यादा कर्मचारी जो इस देश के सिटिजेंस हैं इस स्कीम में कहीं उनके लिए जगह ही नहीं परमानेंट नेचर के काम को लोग डेली वेज से करा लेते हैं मैं समझता हूँ कि लोग का तीस रुपए उस वक्त दिहाड़ी मिल रहा था परमानेंट कर्मचारी का भी सेवा सर्तों में किसी तरह का भी कोई नियम कायदे कानून नहीं थे रेगुलेशन के बारे में प्रमोशन के बारे में या जो भी इंसेंटिव्स देने की स्कीम थी और लगभग 700 लोग तो डेली वीक पे काम कर रहा था जबकि सीपीडब्ल्यूडी के यार्डस्टिक से हिसाब से उनको इंस्टीट्यूट कंसर्टी बना दिया जाना चाहिए था उसके लिए हमने मेमोरेंडम देने का कोशिश की प्रशासन से बात करने की कोशिश की दबाव डालने की भी कोशिश की इसको एक ऑफ द टेबल हल किया जाए जब नहीं हुआ तो भी हम लोगों को एजुकेशन स्टेप उठा के पूरा जो प्रशासन का जो व्यवस्था है उसको जाम कर देना पड़ा एकदम पैरालाइज कर दिया गया फर्स्ट टाइम आईटी कैंपस में बिजली पानी तक का व्यवस्था सब कुछ जाम वॉर इरप्टेड अलॉन्ग इंडिया बॉर्डर विद ईस्ट पाकिस्तान इंडिया सपोर्टेड द लिबरेशन स्ट्रगल फॉर बांग्लादेश इन डायरेक्ट कॉन्फ्रेंटेशन विद पाकिस्तान बट अमेरिका थ्रू इट्स वेट बिहाइंड पाकिस्तान this led to widespread anti-American sentiment in India. The chill in diplomatic relations between the two countries finally led to the folding up of the Kanpur Indo-American program by the end of 1972. 
On the campus, the struggle by the workers continued and students were pulled inexorably into the conflict. Many students were ambivalent as to our lives are being disrupted by a strike. But some students uh, tried to educate us on how it was unfair that a group of working people had to work under conditions that were less than fair. The Karmachari agitation took two years to resolve. This was followed by a period of weak and uncertain administration. Every such shock was chipping away some of the strength of this institute. So by the end of the decade, the institute was really, really in a wounded uh, stage. And the healing process started in the 80s. On the academic front, things were looking bright. All the hard work of the past was paying off and IIT Kanpur was attracting some of the best talent in the country. These bright and motivated students ensured high academic standards and achievements. Many of them went to top graduate schools in America and competed with the best from Western universities. IIT Kanpur name was just getting established. People knew about it. Uh, they knew it was good, uh, but they didn't know how good IIT Kanpur was or how um, amazing it was destined to become over time. So when I came to Berkeley in 1985, and I was, after a year or so, I was on the admissions committee, and at that time, uh, the people had started to uh, uh, see the value of IIT students. Uh, I'm speaking more broadly here, not just IIT Kanpur, because the way uh, the way their reputation was established by was by the quality of work they did. There's no question that IIT Kanpur prepares you uh, in a way that is much, much, much better than than the average American graduate student or uh, undergraduate student would get in an American university. Possibly if you went to MIT, it'd be different. When I graduated from IIT Kanpur, I, I felt I could learn anything and do anything. And so in terms of academics at uh, the University of Hawaii, it was actually very easy. It was literally a cakewalk. It was... When companies hire uh, folks from the IITs, they, 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 have, they know that they're getting somebody who is bright, who is uh, passionate, who is motivated. Um, so th those, those uh, elements are very much at the forefront of people's minds. I think the IIT alum have done so well uh, in the industry and in the institutes, in the financial industry, in the uh, technology world, as well as in the business world, uh, that uh, they, they stand out. And as a result, IIT has become uh, a brand name. And if you say you affiliate or you have an affiliation with IIT, you instant you have instant credibility. Yeah, yeah these are just shots of the campus uh, at that time. Wow. This is uh, Indrajit Purkayasta. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was here. Mm -hmm. uh, he works for iRobot over here. What the hell? Mm -hmm. The success of IIT engineers in the West in the 1980s was seen as a transfer of human capital from India to developed countries, but paid for by the Indian taxpayer. The phenomenon was dubbed brain drain and became a hotly debated issue. Over time, the IITs were identified as a major conduit for this flight of the best Indian brains to the West. Frankly, I mean, when you got to IIT Kanpur, by the time we were there, the batches before us had already set an example where almost 50% or more of those students came to the U.S. for higher studies. And, and those kinds of aspirations uh, loom in your eyes from the day you walk into that campus. We were aware that on the one hand, the nation has subsidized our education hugely. And then without a thought, we were 
just going to, to go abroad. And we didn't know what would happen after that. That was the extent, as I remember, of any self-reflection as to are we a part of the brain drain? Should we come back? What are our duties and responsibilities to our nation? It was not, I have to confess, really in our forebrain, so to speak. Yeah. And some people, some of us, were, did discuss it, did reflect on it, but uh, there was never a clear sense of mission that our nation needs us and therefore we should come back. I'm not blaming anybody, I'm blaming myself, if anything else, because I still have that sense of guilt, if you will. Brain drain became a political issue and the government was in no mood to consider the complexities of the problem. It reacted sharply by cutting funding to the IITs. The effect of the funds crunch on IIT Kanpur was seen immediately. The crisis came to such an extent that uh, once we had to borrow the money for paying the salaries of the staff members here. I mean, there was a fear that uh, experimental work cannot be done because we don't have the money um, for little, little things like stationery or rationing culture was there, you know. Uh, so all these had tremendous constraints on the growth of the institute in the 80s. The government set up the Naidu Amma Committee to assess and suggest reform in the IITs. Based on its extensive recommendations, the IITs were encouraged to increase student strength, to improve accountability and to generate their own funds for growth. Sponsored research and consultancy projects became a major source of funds generation. Worldwide, the research universities work on this pattern that rather than giving them a dole from the government and saying, okay, here is money, you please uh, go and do research, they encourage faculty members to go out and seek money from the funding agency. In return, the faculty member is supposed to deliver certain goods. And that brings in certain level of accountability and certain um, level of uh, seriousness to that work because there is an outside stakeholder which is interested in that research. Uh, giving emphasis on sponsored research and getting money uh, from sponsored research has helped the faculty members becoming empowered in some sense because uh, you, you have a lot of freedom to then uh, develop your laboratory, develop your uh, infrastructure. Earlier, IIT was, I mean, even now IIT is known for its undergraduate teaching. That focus on undergraduate teaching has now gone. The focus is more on research, so once you move your focus, clearly you cannot fo you know, spend, give as much time to teaching. And so now you would find among younger generation, of course there are still excellent teachers, but not as many. More research and more consulting does not dilute teaching. If teaching gets diluted, it is because of attitudes. The wor universities worldwide, which are renowned, they encourage outstanding research and demand good teaching? Well, the downside sometimes is that scholarship of a very high caliber uh, may be traded for doing something because the funding agency wants you to do something. So I think there is some scholarship that should remain outside this game of uh, sponsored research and which has to be then supported by the university in this case, the IIT. Strategic partnerships with industry has also been a source of funds and expertise. The Samtel Center for Color Display Technologies is an example of the institution opening itself out to a close engagement with industry and a different way of functioning. Most academicians in India are not oriented towards industrial applications. So uh, trying to align them to work towards a goal of industry takes away some of the freedom that they have enjoyed in the past. On the other hand, most industrial leaders are not uh, comfortable ask, going into basics. They're more uh, sort of looking at applications. So encouraging them to uh, work patiently with uh, that world and trying to create together uh, outputs or products, uh, something that's, that can be utilized is a very interesting challenge. 
The development of IIT as a brand overseas encouraged a renewed engagement of alumni with their alma mater. The IIT Kanpur Foundation was set up in the US in 2000 and it has provided a platform for the vast network of alumni to share the responsibility of supporting the institution. In a country like India where there, is, where there are so many problems, I don't think government should be spending too much money on IITs. The alumni who today are probably about 10, 12,000 in number just from IIT Kanpur, they should be the ones who should contribute majority of the money to IITs. There are so many alumni who are at the heights of technology all across the world, whether it's in India or whether it's in America or elsewhere. They are many of them, they're running major corporations, doing all kinds of important things. And so they are in a position to hire alumni. They're in a position to provide research grants to alumni. Uh, they're in a position to provide a partnership between academics who wish to come into industry or ac industry uh, who or, uh, practitioners who wish to go back to academia. These are all the things that happen in American public university, this kind of partnership between industry and academia. That kind of uh, ac partnership can be easily facilitated by alumni. In 2009, IIT Kanpur completes 50 years of existence, an occasion that calls for celebration and festivities. But it is said that the second 50 years in the life cycle of an institution need more care and attention. Perhaps this is the right time to reflect on its legacy and consider the challenges of the future. IIT Kanpur would continue to look at research as its mainstay in the time to come and uh, it will continue to do its undergraduate education with utmost commitment, its postgraduate education with even more commitment. We are in a transition for sure in terms of number of students, in terms of what the country expects from us, in terms of how, how much, what is the total amount of students we are catering to at any given time and how we are coping up with the new technological challenges which are coming up in the country and in the new economic scenario in which the country is leading. I think there is a need to much more, put much more focus in trying to uh, relate to the academic programs to the economic and social environment in the country at large, but at least in the region around uh, the IIT. I think when we were students, it was okay to say that you do a set of courses, 90% of them are mandatory courses and 10% of them are electives. I think it was, we took it. But today if you try to do that, if you try to tell a student that most of your content is going to be mandatory, they are not okay with that, they want freedom. So, so I think the, the, the course curriculum has to be designed from that point of view, that they get a breadth, they get reasonable depth, and they should also learn how to make choices. I think all of this, as, as we make the program more flexible, uh, creates the kind of uh, broad-based interdisciplinary knowledge that I think today's world requires. People are spending more time with this inanimate object called the computer. IIT Kanpur for a long, long time had fantastic sports facilities which were central. But over the last one and a half, two years, we are building good sports facilities inside the hostels. Hoping that when you hear the basketball being bounced on the court, even though if you are on your computer, you would just come out. You may not even play the game, but just watching real people play real basketball, 
may bring you out of your room. We need to attract good, you know, young faculty, provide them with all the, you know, basic ingredients for doing research. And I think it's, and this is most important, that we need to make them believe in themselves. Inculcating a sense of responsibility, a sense of belonging, uh, is a major challenge, you know, because pre the previous generation had a natural sense of belonging because they brought up the system. And today, uh, a young researcher sees n number of places, uh, he sees all these opportunities and he sees as an employer. So, there is a change in perspective as far as young faculty members are looking at the institute at 50. The 50-60 years of education in this country has uh, uh, given enormous emphasis on uh, analytical thinking. You know. But you see there is another half of the brain which is called the right half of the brain and supposed to be creative, imaginative, innovative. Ultimately uh, it is what your mind conceives dreams and how you convert them into reality which makes the society move forward. If you don't have the dreams, where is the question of forward movement? We really want human beings which are sensitive, which are creative, which have got talent of all kinds. Uh, I think that is what the society leadership is. And if IITs can't produce such people, who else will do? Ooh!